Welcome to the Exchange Talks live stream um, this evening, led by Tim Cooper. It's great to have so many people here online. As soon as we started broadcasting, the numbers started shooting up, and there are 26 of you so far, and that keeps uh, increasing by the second. So, um, Tim uh, is a colleague who lectures in music technology here at the RCS, and also a PhD candidate who's working on a portfolio of compositions that addresses questions of performance, of audience engagement, of space, and the boundaries between music and the other arts. This evening, he's gonna be talking about um, a recent work called Shadows That in Darkness Dwell. Uh, and I'd recommend the recording that you heard part of just there, which is available um, on Bandcamp under the, the night with and I'm sure Tim will have a reference to that on slides somewhere. Uh, a couple of um, housekeeping things. Uh, at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, you should just see a Q&A box. If you have a question for Tim, um, type in there. We'll take questions at the end of the talk um, and uh, address all your queries, I hope, at that stage. So just, but you can type in at any time and we'll go through the questions right at the end. Uh, you can also use that if you just want to say hi to Tim. I'll pass that on to um, I'll repeat this at the end, but just to mention that next week's talk with, is with Alex South. He'll be talking about Humpback Whale Song and the schedule's on the Exchange Talk site. Uh, and you can also go to the Twitter account, RC, at RCS underscore the Exchange. But uh, enough of me. Um, I'd like to hand over right now to Tim Cooper. Uh, I hope you enjoy the talk. Good evening, and thanks to the Research and Knowledge Exchange team and Alistair for inviting me to talk about a recent composition, Shadows That in Darkness Dwell, which was commissioned by uh, The Night With, uh, who are a series of, of concerts of mostly contemporary classical music um, in informal settings. The creation of the work was supported by the Hope Scott Trust and the Fenton Arts Trust, who provided funding for the development process of the work. Um, so Shadows That in Darkness Dwell is an extended work of around 17 minutes composed for recorder, countertenor, theorbo, baroque cello and multi-channel electronics. 
The work is based on material composed by John Dowland and his Seven Tears figured in Seven Passionate Pavans, which he published in 1604. I composed this work for uh, Laszlo Rocha, uh, Rory McCleary, Alex McCartney and Lucia Capilaro. Uh, the music you were listening to as you joined us was a recording of Dowland's work performed by Laszlo, Rory, Alex and Lucia and it is this work that my project is based upon. In this talk I'm going to give some background to the work to give a sense of how it came about, uh, give an overview of the work and discuss aspects of the player's contributions to the creative process. Before starting this project, I already had a background in early music. Um, prior to my conservatoire training as a brass player, um, I also took up the recorder because I was developing a real love for early music. And I wanted to be able to play it and I wanted to be able to play it on the instrument it was written for, or the instruments it was written for. I had a really inspiring teacher called Jane Mitchell. And uh, during this period, she encouraged me to attend the Northern Recorder and Viol Summer School, which is known as Norvis. And during my second year at the course, I worked on performing trio sonatas with some of my fellow students. In these sessions, I first encountered the Theorbo and I was immediately intrigued by the size of the instrument and even more so by its sound. During my recorder studies, I worked with Jane on the Dutch Renaissance recorder player and composer Jacob van Eyck's variations on the Pavan Lacrimae by Dowland, which is in the top right hand corner of um, this slide. And this was my route into John Dowland. Um, in those lessons, uh, Jane encouraged me to think about the text of the song as I was performing the variations, choosing how to phrase and where to breathe based on the text. And this is my first musical memory of thinking about text so explicitly. Uh, and I was really struck by the haunting words of the song. And uh, this is just a short excerpt from one of the variations from uh, Jakob van Eyck's variations from uh, Der Fluiten Lusthof, which is the flute player's garden of delights. Uh, during my conservatoire training as a brass player undergraduate level and a composer at master's level, um, I developed my interest in early music further. As a brass player, I played almost exclusively uh, early music and new music. I made arrangements of early pieces by composers like Santini, who was a kind of little known Italian composer, and, uh, and J.S. Bach. In 2011, as a composer, I made two pieces specifically for period instruments. The first was called Slipstream and it was for Sackbutt and Electronics. And the second uh, was an early version of Shadows That in Darkness Dwell, which was composed for Viol Consort and was a finalist in the National Centre for Early Music Composition Competition. And the piece was then workshopped by Fretwork. Aspects of those pieces were successful um, particularly the viol piece, which I think texturally and timbrally um, was really effective um, and reasonably well written for the instruments. Um, but I always felt that the material deserved a more extended and a better thought through piece to find a home in. We can fast forwards to 2018 and I was beginning to develop ideas of returning to shadows that in darkness dwell. That summer, I visited Norvis as an audience member uh, for a concert of works by a retiring recorder teacher who I'd known called Alan Davis. And following the concert, I was talking to recorder player Una Lee um, about the idea of working with a mixed ensemble of period instruments uh, with electronics and my kind of desire to return to the music of John Dowland. Una passed me details for players in Scotland who might be interested in the project, uh, Laszlo, Lucia and Alex. And on making contact with them, Laszlo also put me in touch with Rory. Uh, we all had some discussions and uh, to see if they might be interested in working on the project and listen to the recording. And I listened to lots of recordings of them all playing in a variety of styles. And the early discussions and my sense of them as performers from their recordings seemed to suggest that this might be a kind of good match. 
At the start of the project, I was interested in exploring how I could relate the music of John Dowland to an electroacoustic sound world, which is kind of now my musical home. I was interested in working with a mixed ensemble, having previously worked with the really homogenous sound of the viol consort. Um, I wanted to try and avoid uh, mimicking a couple of things that I'd done in previous pieces. Um, Fata Morgana, which is for clarinet and electronics, where I really used the, um, the uh, a blending of the same sound world of, of the uh, same instrument group to create relationships with the electroacoustic part. I wanted to create something with more diverse sounds um, to, to find out what, what, what results um, might come out of that. Um, I also wanted to avoid just rehashing what I'd done for viols in the first place in Shadows That In Darkness Dwell. In terms of working with the musicians, the process became more collaborative as we worked together. Their creative input through improvisation and playful shaping of my material provided new sounds and textures for me to explore in the electroacoustic part and in the material for the ensemble. This wasn't necessarily a particular aim for the piece to become quite collaborative, but it was a really interesting process, I think, for us all to explore that I'll try and unpack a little bit of towards the end of this talk. Prior to composing the work, I put in place a process with the musicians that included time to record materials for the electroacoustic part and to workshop materials for the piece with the full ensemble. I decided to begin by working on instrumental material and plan how to approach recording source material for the electroacoustic part. My approach to this was to explore the melodic and harmonic material of Dowland's original work and adapt, extend uh, melodic and harmonic fragments. My principal aesthetic idea at the start was to create shadows to really play on that word in the title and from the text from Dowland between different musical layers and creating lots of similar material uh, with you know kind of quite small differences which I could overlap and overlay and uh, this would allow me to kind of develop uh, instrumental and vocal material that would shadow one another. In making this material, I tried to really extend and languish upon the musical ideas, trying to create melodic lines that would really heighten the emotive quality of the original material. I also composed uh, some harmonic drones uh, for the musicians. You can see these in the second stave of the, uh, the two vocal lines. Um, the idea being to give the players a, a kind of backdrop to, to sing or play against. So they had a sense of how those notes were kind of meant to fit in with other possible notes so that they could really lean into notes that feel a little bit uncomfortable or to really arrive on notes where there's a real sense of agreement. Um, and this seemed to really help them um, as, as the kind of context of this pitch material was audibly apparent to them. Um, as an electroacoustic composer, the first recording sessions were hugely important for me. Um, but as a composer, they were also a really important first opportunity to work with the players directly. And we did this one-on-one. -on -one. I needed to start to build a relationship with them. And in terms of the piece, I needed to record enough material uh, to compose the electroacoustic part. So I was also conscious of making sure that we captured contrasting sounds with enough different dynamic and timbre shapes to sustain an extended work. With each of the musicians, we began by working on the material that I'd prepared. Uh, we discussed aspects of style and interpretation as we were working. I was really interested in the character of their, their instruments and their particular sound. And I wanted to foreground this through closely miking the instruments to get really intimate sound and highlight small details. But I also wanted them to play the material as if they were playing John, the music of John Dowland in a kind of heightened, exaggerated way. Improvisation and ornamentation of melodic material are really important parts of performing music from the Renaissance period. And this is something that I wanted to capture in these recording sessions. In terms of this decoration, I asked them to play each piece of material in three different ways. Firstly, I asked them to play it in the style they would expect to play this material and with no ornamentation.
Uh, next, I asked them to play the material in the style they would expect to play the material and with a stylistically appropriate ornamentation. So something that would have been kind of familiar sound to John Dowland in the era that he was writing this music. Finally, I asked them to play the material in a more exaggerated style with really extreme over ornamentation or what Dowland might have thought of as slightly untasteful. Uh, I wanted to push the material a little bit away from its stylistic comfort zone, uh, but not so far that I wouldn't be able to relate it back to Dowland. Um, I also expected that the more decorated material would sound more effective using certain kinds of uh, processing, like creating echoes where um, you'd hear repetitions of the same sound and that would be able to create the shadowing effect more effectively with this uh, more decorative material. In each of the sessions, the musicians took the material much further than I expected. Um, they're much more familiar with this material as players than I am, and I was really struck by their flexibility in exploring this material in great detail through playful improvisation. And this sense of play became increasingly important uh, through the rehearsal process, which I'll discuss later. With each musician, uh, I also wanted to work on material that I could expect to explore texturally in the electroacoustic part. Normally, I would use what I would call spectrally detailed material uh, to do this, and the, opportun the opportunity to reveal spectral detail through filtering uh, the sounds or stretching them or dealing with tiny little fragments of the sound usually seems to be greater when the source material, the recording, already has a degree of um, timbral play within it, um, even before I start manipulating it with processing. In the sessions, we discussed various techniques and we recorded materials from a number of them. Uh, aspects like with the string players, Lucia and Alex, we explored some kind of relatively straightforward techniques like sol ponticello, where the player uh, performs the sound at the bridge of the instrument and you get a kind of icy sound or the opposite, which is called saltasto, where you play the sound at the, at the fingerboard and you get a much more kind of soft, uh, slightly unfocused, warm sound. Um, when recording these materials with Alex and Lucia in particular, I asked them to shape these sounds with a different kind of pacing to the harmonically driven melodic material that we've already heard. Um, I gave them relatively simple instructions to create perhaps X number of dynamic shapes, maybe three or five or seven, um, and to give a particular dynamic profile. So maybe starting loud and getting quieter, starting quiet and getting louder and then getting quieter again. And the aim of this was to allow them to really focus on what I was wanting them to do, which was to create interesting timbres, interesting textures, rather than focusing on overly complex notation to try and communicate these ideas. Um, I wanted the sounds to evolve over a longer period of time so I could create materials um, that would push forwards the structure of the piece more slowly, um, whereas the, the instrumental material we've already heard is, is going to move it along quite quickly. Um, what I think you can hear in this next example is that the ear is drawn differently to the sound. I find I can listen in more detail to the smaller aspects of the sounds rather than my ear being drawn to the more obvious melodic shapes of the previous examples. <laughs> Once I'd uh, recorded the materials, uh, once I'd recorded the materials, I began to edit and then process these to create new sounds that could be used in the electroacoustic and the instrumental parts. 
I created three types of electroacoustic materials. Um, firstly, materials based on melodic movement. Uh, these create echoing shadows of the instrumental material, thickening the sound and decorating the melodic line. Uh, secondly, I made uh, some fragmentary granular sounds. Uh, these are based on the more textural recordings or on capturing really tiny little fragments of the instrumental and vocal sounds. Uh, finally, uh, more sustained sounds that create a sense of space. Uh, these provide a sound world for the ensemble to inhabit. I'm going to give an overview of the work's structure before going on to talk a little more about the contribution of the players and some of the ways the compositional process embraced their um, creative contributions. Uh, the structure of my work is based upon the structure of Dowland's Flow My Tears. It's kind of a big blowing up uh, um, of that structure. His song has uh, three musical refrains or kind of three sections and six verses of text. Its form is A, A, B, B, C, C. So you hear um, each passage of music twice. Um, and my piece uses this as a kind of frame. There are three main sections that each explore an aspect of one of the refrains uh, which are linked by two short interludes. Um, section one is called flow and it explores the stately mood of the pavan. Uh, Dowland's work is a pavan, a slow, stately, courtly dance. Um, and it's a kind of slow reading through of the material and text from this first refrain. The phrasing of the instrumental material is, is pretty slow and deliberate. Um, I ask the ensemble to play much of the material unsynchronized, so, so not together, um, in order to create these layers of melodic motion that flow over one another, uh, creating an effect of the ensemble shadowing one another. Each phrase played by the ensemble is underpinned by the phrasing of the electroacoustic part, which articulates the musical gesture and reflects aspects of the instrumental and vocal lines adding to the shadowing effect of the instrumental material. Uh, this excerpt is from the very start of the piece. Flow my tears. <laughs> The two interludes uh, connect the three main sections. The playing style of the ensemble is much uh, simpler here and the textures are 
more transparent. Uh, in interlude one, the voice leads, and it's supported by the Theorbo and the Baroque cello. The second main section is called Fled, and the material is more fleeting and improvisatory. The underlying rhythm of the section is quicker and more dexterous. I ask the ensemble to improvise on specific material that changes to underpin the phrasing of the electroacoustic part, uh, which for the most part drives the, uh, the, uh, the movement forward. The instrumental material used is organized into box notation uh, with instructions and on the bottom of the screen you can see a box with some some fragments of notation and some some kind of short instructions for imp uh, for specific improvisations. Um, the instructions are also given regarding the phrasing of the mod melodic material. Um, so, for example, in this first box, uh, the cello is asked to occasionally accent and lengthen the note when they land on on a C. Um, that's because this pitch contradicts the harmonic background of the electroacoustic part and gives this an, a feeling of suspension of the of the cello disagreeing with the electroacoustic part. Moving between the different boxes, I explore changes in, in texture, so which instruments are playing at any one time, the register, so how high or low um, the ensemble are playing, or the intensity, how, how much stuff is happening at any one time and how uh, aggressively or not the ensemble should be playing. Seconds. The function of the second interlude um, is exactly the same as the first, um, but here the melodic texture is led by the recorder. The final section is called Darkness, and th this is a painting of the line, Hark you shadows that in darkness dwell, which the title of my piece comes from. Um, and this, uh, this text appears in stanzas five and six, um, and it's a particular painting of the word darkness. Following a short introductory phrase quoting the first line of this passage, the electroacoustic material descends into a dark and spacious sound world. Uh, during this passage, uh, towards the end of this uh, first passage, Alex speaks the words from the second line of stanza five, learn to contemn light, at which point the sound world lightens and opens up as the recorder player, Laszlo, begins an extended solo passage, which is imitated in the electroacoustic uh, part with brightly filtered echoes. The work concludes with a relatively static passage comprising long held pitches in the recorder, countertenor and cello, which are articulated by the theorbo. Learn to contend.
In this final section of my talk, I'm going to discuss what Laszlo, Rory, Alex and Lucia brought to the process in a little more detail. I'm not trying to make any broad claims about working with early music performers more generally, but to unpick some aspects of the process that were shaped by their creative input. As I've alluded to, play and improvisation are integral parts of their practice. They each have different approaches to this and the work draws upon these. Rory and Laszlo are both excellent at decorating um, uh, melodic material and their improvisations that I recorded at the start of the project are used within their own parts. Uh, through transcribing these improvisations, I formalized uh, these into some of the sections, particularly in the final section of the work in the extended recorder solo we just heard, which is entirely made up of transcriptions of Laszlo improvising on uh, based on the musical material I composed for the initial recording sessions. There is a contradiction here. Through transcribing the improvisation, it becomes an entirely different type of musical object. The inherent playfulness is slightly disconnected from the material, um, but this was necessary in order to use that material within the electroacoustic part. Echoes of Laszlo's melodic material are heard in the electroacoustic part, creating a direct relationship between his performance and the electroacoustic material, which acts as his shadow in that passage. However, in most of the passages, I would also expect the players uh, to further play with the material through adapting and ornamenting their parts. Lucia uh, performs in a very wide variety of styles, including jazz and with uh, DJ Yoda as well. And this informs her approach to sound. Uh, as we heard earlier, she has a really excellent ear for shaping sounds timbrally and texturally. Um, and this allowed me to use the cello part as one of the key links between the instrumental material and the more textural material in the electroacoustic part. <laughs> As a theorbist, Alex is very used to improvising accompaniment material. In our conversations uh, through the rehearsal process, uh, we discussed his approach and adapted material to suit the way that he thinks about improvisation and accompaniment. He emphasized the importance of the underlying harmony and how that directs the size and duration of the musical gestures that he chooses to play. Through trying different combinations of chords and describing different functions for Alex's accompaniment passages, we arrived upon a final version that made use of harmonic sequences that Alex improvised and which I then transcribed into the score. His part includes um, quite detailed instructions for the style of decoration, which Alex then realizes in performance. <laughs> And that uh, sound example was uh, from very near the end of the piece as it's kind of coming to its close. Um, there's a sense of losing energy and uh, drawing to a close. Um, the composition of the work necess necess necessitated fixing some aspects that the group would be more used to improvising. Um, where a sense of play and creativity is focused in the performance of this work is on how their parts interrelate with the electroacoustic part. This is conceived as individual counterparts for each instrument that then make up the overall sound world. The players are aware uh, of the material that they directly interact with, like the shadows of vocal and uh, recorder melodies, the timbral material that Lucia was interacting with, or the cadential shapes that Alex articulates. And they're aware of how their parts relate from moment to moment. These interactions give each of the main sections their characters, and these are contrasted by the interludes where the musical material imitates the style of Dowland's original work, embedded within the context of the electroacoustic part, which reframes the material. The player's touch and sensibility in performing on their instruments is also important. 
electroacoustic composers Simon Waters and Simon Emerson, who have also both composed for period in instruments, comment upon this in their thinking about composing for period instruments. And Simon Waters tells us that the relationship between line and ornamentation is key to the successful delivery of much classical music and the preceding Baroque repertoire, depending on subtle hierarchies of weighting and articulation, which arise out of the composely understanding of the instrument's response to the player. The interaction between player and air column is palpable in an instrument in which the fingers are in direct connection with and cause switching pat interference patterns in the resonating air column. And uh, Simon Waters is talking about flutes uh, here. He's a flautist and he's talking about what it means to play and what it means to play and compose. Uh, composers in the Renaissance and the Baroque period would also have been performers and performers would have also composed. And uh, this innate understanding of instrumental performance and what an instrument offers you is a kind of huge part and there, there's a real separation of that. I don't have that feeling in the same way about these instruments that Dowland would have had. And trying to find that sense of touch came through the collaboration. Um, Simon Emerson, in an interview with harpsichordist Jane Chapman, who he composed for, highlights the relationship between material and instrument, describing how uh, Simon gradually became aware that much Baroque figuration was strongly influenced by the nature of the instrument. I always felt that most keyboard music from this period didn't really work so well on the piano. You introduced me to the unmeasured preludes by Louis Couperin from the 17th century and realised that I was searching for a similar feel in points of departure. To conclude, Jacobian poet Richard Barnfield provides a window to Dowland and how his playing was revered in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, emphasising this notion of touch. If music and sweet poetry agree, as they must needs, the sister and the brother, then must the love be great twixt thee and me, because thou lovest the one and I the other. Dowland to thee is dear, whose heavenly touch upon the lute doth ravish human sense. Spencer to me, whose deep conceit is such, as passing all conceit needs no defence. Thou lovest to hear the sweet melodious sound that Phoebus's lute, the queen of music makes. And I, in deep delight, am chiefly drowned when as himself to singing he betakes. One God is God of both, as poets feign. One night loves both, and both in thee remain. Thank you for listening, and hopefully Alistair has collected some questions from you. Thank you, Tim. That was a really interesting talk. Hi, Alistair. Um, hi. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Quite a quite a good crowd. Um, uh, if you have questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, type your questions, and um, I can put them to Tim. Um, first one's from, from uh, Stephen Broad. Uh, Stephen says, hi, really interesting to hear you speak about this music. Thank you. I'm intrigued by the way you refer to your music. You speak frequently about the material. At one point earlier on, you spoke about the material deserving more extended treatment. It seems to give the music, or should that be the material, almost a life of its own, independent of you. Uh, I'd be interested to hear you say a little bit more about how you understand your relationship with the music. Yeah, that's um, a really interesting question. And thank you, uh, Stephen, for it. So I think uh, one of the things about being an electroacoustic composer that's kind of nice is that you have a you can have a quite objective relationship with your material. You record some sounds, you edit the sounds, you process the sounds, and you find what emerges from that material. It's a, I, I wrote the word mining earlier while I was thinking about what I wanted to say about this piece and that it's not the right word, but I kind of go searching for what the material offers me. So I don't feel like it's a kind of egoful, um, outpouring for me um, in the kind of romantic sense of composing I feel that it's partly my job to be at the service of the material and to try and tease out what it offers and what it can achieve 
um, in, a, in a kind of slightly objective sense. And of course, there's my baggage in there. There's my interpretation of that material. Um, but the, the more I stay objective about it, the more um, productive and creative I tend to be. And I think I think that uh, I think I think that's sort of what you're getting at, possibly, I hope. Thanks. Uh, that's really interesting. I'd just like to follow up on that. You say it's not a kind of um, outpouring of your ego. It seems very much in this piece that you brought together uh, a bunch of musicians and you all contributed a huge amount comparatively to this. It was less a kind of a traditional composition in the sense of you writing and then performing, but much more a sense of you all bringing to this project things, surprising each other. Um, and and learning things i suppose I, a couple of things are, are there things that those the, the performers learnt that they were surprised by that they told you about and also what might you do in the future maybe with these musicians are you, are you planning more um i'll start with the planning more because i think the first part of that needs a little bit more teasing um i need to think about that um so yes we are planning more which is 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 good um we have a show planned in october um current situation permitting at the conservatoire and um when i started this project i sort of imagined uh, a suite of works um but i also at the same time didn't want to decide that the first thing i was going to do with these players was to write a 60 minute enormous project without a way in so um, what I'm aiming for towards October is to create this suite of works, um, uh, seven shadows after seven tiers. So seven different ways of looking at the material of John Dowland. Um, I've been thinking uh, a bit about his piece, Semper Dowland, Semper Dolans, which means always Dowland, always dolorous or miserable. And I've been looking at uh, the notion of melancholy which is a, a a big part of the Elizabethan psyche and um, I've been looking at texts that talk about melancholy and also scientific texts of the period that uh, that discuss melancholy to see if there are ways I can integrate uh, text maybe into the electroacoustic part by, rather than into the live part to create a, a kind of different dynamic so I, again I don't want to remake this piece but shorter I want to find other ways into the material of Dowland and uh, the first part of the question were there things that surprised the players um, I'm not sure if surprised is the right word but one of the things we discussed was um, they felt like the piece had a kind of affinity with them and um, and, and perhaps that is a surprise because they talked about how often composers come at period instruments almost as a kind of curiosity, as a kind of a toy to try something new with. Um, whereas I, I, I definitely didn't want it to be a curiosity and I didn't want to just compose material that maybe would have worked better on a modern cello. I really wanted to explore what those instruments and those players offered. Uh, um, so I think I also think the collaborative process allowed that because they were involved uh, at kind of key points in the process, um, which meant that that their voices weren't lost. Uh, there wasn't a point where I really felt I went away and I was without them. Uh, um, I felt like I had, you know, I had video of the rehearsal and our conversation, so I could always kind of go back and think, you know, what what actually were they talking about? Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a few more questions. Um... Uh, one from Diana Salazar. Um, it was interesting to hear that you found text important during an initial account encounter with early music. Tell us a bit more about how you approached the use of text in this work. Yeah, so the use of text in this piece, um, again, it's a, it's a bit like the structure of the piece. It's kind of a big blowing up of it. So I don't use every word from the song by any any uh, any means. Um, I use very few words um, to try and articulate very specific feel for for the different sections, um, and try and to try and give a kind of um, overview of the the content of the song. The whole song. Um, one of the things I found working with words elsewhere. I've worked with poets on collaborative works. One of the things that I found elsewhere is um, in other pieces is that. Um, 
poetry moves faster than electroacoustic music and the phrasing of electroacoustic music it takes time for for the sounds to move from place to place and to establish sound worlds whereas you can move from idea to idea uh, very quickly it's very ephemeral and so i felt that it needed that kind of staying with the text so in the first passage it very much uses the ter uh, the words flow my tears or pretty much all the way through that whole section that's just one line from that stanza Sorry, uh, just finding my mute button. Uh, just a follow-up question from from Brianna. Uh, what what was your method for selecting the sections of text? I think you partly covered that. Was there anything else to add? Um, I suppose one of the yeah, it was it was that idea of trying to really articulate a feel of the section of that passage of text or that passage of music. So in the a second refrain of the song it's a little bit lighter it, it feels a little bit less morose melancholic and um, there's an optimism and uh, I wanted to attach onto that and um, create this kind of more fleeting dexterous less heavy less um, moribund kind of feeling and so I, I attached onto fled so since the the line in, that I use in that passage is since pity is fled and the countertenor doesn't do very much in that whole section um, he, he articulates uh, big changes just with single words but the interesting thing was the difference that that made to that section and also to I think Rory's engagement with that section otherwise he would have been uh, maybe a bit of a bystander in 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 quite a quite a chunky bit of the piece and that didn't feel quite right and then in the final section it just uses the text of the title which also comes from stanza th uh, stanza five and six shadows that in darkness dwell um so in some ways it's quite a simple use of text but trying to really articulate a singular idea within a section so it, it doesn't become too confused great thanks um, from Lucy Hollingworth. Uh, thanks, Tim. I'm interested in how the performance was managed. Did the material need direction or was it possible for everyone to negotiate the score as a chamber ensemble? How successful were the challenges of the ensemble for the ensemble in live performance? Yeah, this was um, this was really satisfying. Uh, so uh, they were fantastic. They played it unconducted. Um, they had a computer screen which gave them a display of the time of the piece. And um, in some of the slides, you might have seen uh, time codes um, showing where certain key moments happen. Um, as we rehearsed, I probably took out more and more of those uh, timings um, and said, actually, you just need to play this at this tempo and you know, make sure that you end it by here or to allow a bit more of that kind of freer interpretation. Um, really early on in the process, the first time we got together, um, they hadn't really worked in that way before as a chamber ensemble. And so um, we spent a lot of time on about a minute's music, getting them familiar with that way of working together. And um, I suggested, you know, we could have one player kind of conduct uh, while at the instrument um, and they were really against that they they really didn't want to um, I think what was interesting because Rory's also a conductor um, so as a singer is very comfortable directing um, as well as being directed and uh, that meant he was able to take a lot of autonomy within the piece um, where perhaps other singers might have needed to be micromanaged I hope that's not too rude to say Thanks. I, I, again, following up a little bit from that, Diana asks, um, she said, I really enjoyed your discussion of play and how this exploration of play formed part of your compositional process. How important is it for the ensemble to carry this experience of play from workshop rehearsals uh, into the performance itself? Yeah, I think, I think without them being playful, um, a lot of the material that I wrote um, probably doesn't... Um, doesn't survive very well. Um, a lot of it's pretty straightforward. I mean, at the, at the end of the process, I uh, after the last performance said, by the way, just how hard is this? And they said, really not very hard at all um, in terms of playing technique. Um, but in terms of engagement with material, I think there's enough to keep them interested and keep them finding more. I mean, the, the electroacoustic part is so dense and detailed that they, I think there's always more stuff for me to find, let alone someone else. There are probably layers that um, I found in it when I was mixing the final recording. I thought, oh, I, I kind of wasn't aware that that was there. And um, there, are, there are moments that can be synchronized 
if they work really, really hard at it. And I think they take satisfaction out of that. So coming from being unsynchronized into being absolutely synchronized on a moment, I think they took real satisfaction out of finding moments like that. And they don't always happen in performance, um, but that, that's okay for the piece. But I think the effort and the intent uh, retains that sense of playfulness. And uh, in their solo passages, uh, towards the final performance of the run, we did three performances, um, I noticed that they all ornamented more. Um, as they became kind of more confident that, that that wasn't going to 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 ruin anything that they or at least that was my interpretation from from outside uh, looking in thanks just one more question and uh, i yeah maybe uh, maybe something you need no for a while, but Amy uh, Mackenzie asks, I uh, says, wonderful piece, Tim, maybe some similar to some other questions that you might be asked. Could you give a little bit more insight into your process of decision making when processing source materials? How do you narrow down decisions given that there are arguably endless ways you can play with one sound? And I guess perhaps there are endless ways to answer this question. Yeah, I think this probably comes back to Stephen's original question where he's, you know, he's asking maybe where's the Tim Cooper in all of this? Um, I, I I think all composers have chains of processing that they maybe go back to um, time and time again. But what I tried to find in uh, these particular in this particular piece was to retain that sense of movement, um, and and that happened through kind of playing with the processing. So setting up a kind of set of parameters and then allowing them or, or causing them to change so that the, the particular sound changes moment to moment. And that created more movement in this piece than perhaps in other pieces of mine that are more static um, and, and stable. And um, I'm, I'm really fascinated by smaller sounds becoming bigger. Um, so I think I always look for the little sounds and try and find a way to um, heighten or amplify or, or put a micro, uh, magnifying glass in front of them. So anything that does that, like uh, granular processing that takes small fragments that I can then give a bit more energy to through that processing. Um, I think, uh, I suppose, yeah, uh, and to just summarize, what, what's really important about this though is that if I'm using the same processing, but I put different stuff in, then it's going to give me a different result. So it's also about the amount of energy that is put in through the source sound. So if you feed the same engine with a different sound, then it's going to feed back out something different. And then it, it for me, it becomes to responding to that. Oh, oh, that that surprised me. What what might I do to push that further? Um, and what might I do to um, harness that if I found it interesting or not? Thanks. Thanks, Tim. And uh, I think we'll wrap up there. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. As I said earlier, uh, the piece is available at Bandcamp. Uh, if you look for The Night With, you'll find Tim's piece there. And also to reiterate that next week's talk um, is by Alex South, who'll be talking about Humpback Whale Song. Uh, again, the schedule's on the ICS uh, Exchange Talk site and at rcs underscore the exchange if you're on twitter so once again thanks tim and uh goodbye everybody thanks everyone it's really nice to ec you um and uh yeah if you want to catch the recording it's also on apple music and spotify if you're streamers rather than cds um anyway have fun nice to see you <laughs>